someone else is joining, so we'll just hang on for them. Started on chapter one. Anybody got anything they need to clear up before we get going? Okay. All right. So I'm going to try doing this via a share screen rather than loading it in to the collaborate room, so we'll see how this works. Because I've got a couple of film clips to show you as well. So we need, okay, that's come up good. We need that full size. Is that okay for everybody? chapter one um, and we're going to introduce the model that really the whole semester is based on all right so um, try to pay attention when we're looking at the constraints model because as I said <clears throat> the rest of the chapters and the assignments really build on this idea that is introduced here in chapter one Okay, so if you have questions, if I say something and you're not really following what I'm saying, please jump in and ask questions. It's, it's very important that you understand uh, what this model is trying to represent for you. Okay? Alright, so this class is called Motor Behaviour. Motor behavior is uh, a discipline umbrella, and under that umbrella we have motor development, motor learning, and motor control. All right? um, we don't do any motor control in our program, um, but there is a motor learning class, a 400 level class that Dr. Guerra runs. Um, so I'm covering the motor development and we'll touch on some motor learning principles right at the end of the semester. Okay, so um, motor behavior um, is a, a quite well spread discipline now. When I was an undergrad, we did not have motor development. Um, motor behavior was only motor learning and motor control. Motor development really came to the fore in the early 80s and I had graduated undergrad just about by then. So um, having flunked several classes took me a while to actually graduate. Um, so um, yeah, I didn't get to do any motor development as an undergrad. So it's very exciting to be able to share this information with you because I think it really changes your approach to teaching and coaching motor skills, okay? Um, so jump in, ask any questions as we go along, all right? Um, so we're looking at the movement behavior that we're observing, all right? So the motor skill. And the changes that we see in this behavior across the lifespan are continuous, Right? We don't um, have like this massive learning of motor skills into our early 20s and then we stop learning motor skills. All right? Changes in movement behavior occur right across the lifespan. Um, some of them, particularly the early ones that we'll be looking at, are age-related, but they're not age-dependent. 
All right, what we'll find out as we work through is that experience and practice play a really large role in many of the motor skills that we can do. All right. And we'll also see that, again, particularly the early ones are sequential. We can't skip a level and learn the next skill. Right? We have to go through the sequence to learn these skills. Okay? So the definition of motor development then is a continuous age-related process of change in movement. All right, and, and we like to look at the underlying processes to understand what's really going on. All right, so it's a functional capacity for this movement that we're, that we're looking at. Okay? So I mentioned motor learning. Motor learning looks at how does the brain learn a motor skill? How do I organize practice so that the brain can learn a particular type of skill. So you may not know, it's a different, you know, different types of skills need different setups in a practice environment for the most optimum learning of that skill. Okay. So when we're looking at motor learning, we're looking at what should be permanent gains in the skill performance that's associated with practice, all right? And then motor control, the area of motor control is fascinating. Um, we just don't, unfortunately, have room on the degree plan to squeeze it in there. But it looks at the nervous system, at the brain, and at the control of the movement. How is the movement initiated in the brain? How does that signal get to a muscle? Um, what's the impact when the signal gets to the muscle? It's a very fascinating area of, of study. All right. So the, the motor learning then is a change in behavior rather than a sequential continuum that we're looking at in motor development. And motor control is the neural system, the nervous system control of the skills. All right. So some terms in, um, that are used when we're looking at motor behavior um, that sometimes in regular language um, are used in a different way. So as we work through the textbook, occasionally we'll have to um, define a term that seems obvious just to make sure that we're using it in the scientific um, form rather than in everyday language form. All right. So um, physical growth is a quantitative, so that's a numerical, increase in size or body mass. All right. So if I grow taller, Right? That would fit that definition. Okay? Um, it's important to understand the difference because if I grow taller, we see a change in the movement skill, but that change isn't necessarily good development of the skill. It's just change based on the fact that I grew taller. Right? Maturation is qualitative, so it's um, more subtle, right? What's the, what's the optimum functioning for the digestive system? What's the optimum functioning for the muscular system? All right? So maturation is looking at what point does a particular system meet optimal functioning, adult level functioning? And then aging, again, seems kind of obvious, but we're looking at the passage of time, uh, which losses of motor skills are caused by aging and which are caused by lifestyle choices. All right? 
So we see physiological changes that are continuous regardless of our chronological age. So when we're in our 80s, we lose muscle mass even if we go to the gym and train every day. Now, if we go to the gym and train every day, we can minimize our functional loss because of the muscle mass, but we can't stop it, right? We're 80, things are winding down, right? That's how it works, okay? So historically, motor development research um, looked at, if we go back, way back to the early 1920s and 1930s through to the 80s, it was PE research at that time. It wasn't called motor development. But historically, um, they only looked at children and youth. They did not look at adults. They didn't look at older adults. They didn't look at very young children, right? There was this idea that all, all movement skills occurred between sort of five, six, seven, and, and late teens, early 20s. Right, so now we, we understand that that is not necessarily the case. And if you're interested in an elderly population, this can be a very fascinating group to look at because, because we've got better nutrition and better uh, medical services and things like that, the percentage of an aging population is, is ever growing. Right? So we need to understand that population well. We need to understand what movement skills they can and can't achieve to help them have the most productive life. Okay? So, um, let's have a look here. Let's, are we going to look at our model for the first time? We think that's the next slide. Oh, no, drop that one. There we go. Okay, this is our model. Very simple, right? We like that. We like simple models um, because they're easy to follow, they're easy to use, which is the main point of them, right? Um, this model was developed in 1986, and Newell's theory of constraints was looking at. Um, changes in movement patterns that were um, based upon a developmental perspective. So this constraints theory actually comes from dynamical systems theory. Dynamical systems theory was created, I think, in astrophysics or some crazy complicated world, right? Um, and dynamical systems theory is fascinating, but it's complicated. There's a lot of mathematics involved. Um, and so uh, that's, that theory was taken by different disciplines and they adapted it a little bit to fit their discipline. So thankfully for us who are teachers, not lab researchers, Newell took dynamical systems theory and said, huh, how can we actually use this in an applied day-to-day -day manner? And he came up with a triangle, which I'm very grateful for, okay? So, what the triangle represents is that the person doing the movement, right, this individual up the top here, and the movement that you're asking them to do, and the place where they're doing it, all interact to give um, the movement pattern that you watch and teach. Okay? So we can. Um, we could equate the individual as the who, right? The task as the what, what's the purpose, right? And the environment as the where, 
What are the surroundings, right? What's occurring here? And so then the circular arrows are telling us that these three, the who, the what, and the where, interact and we see an emerging movement pattern. So when we get changes in the who, the what, or the where, then we see changes in the movement pattern. All right? So I'm just going to jump back to the whiteboard here. How do I do that? I have to do that. And I have to do this. So you could say observable movement. There's various different terms you could use for here. The movement pattern that's emerging. All right. So this arrow represents the fact that the interaction creates the movement pattern that we see. All right. Are there any questions on that basic idea? As I said, the, the whole book kind of sits on this model. So um, we want to make sure that the model is clear. Then what we find is that 
the three types of constraints can do two things, right? Something could happen, or I could be given a task I can't manage, or the environment may change, and it may discourage a particular movement, right? So we could say it discourages or it limits certain movement patterns. But if it's discouraging one type of movement pattern, it's encouraging another type of movement pattern. Right? So we can say it encourages or permits different types of movement. Right? So the interaction shapes the movement. Right? And sometimes certain combinations of constraints channel us away from certain learning certain movements and kind of point us in the direction of other <coughs> movements. For example, right, if you're a school kid in the UK, you might very well learn to play cricket, right? If you're a school kid in the US, so we change the environment, you're not going to learn cricket, but you're going to learn baseball. But if you're in the UK, you don't learn baseball, you learn cricket. Right? So we discourage baseball in the UK because it just is not played there. Maybe it is now. I've been over here a long time, but certainly wasn't when I left, right? Baseball wasn't a thing. Um, but cricket is huge, okay? Over here, many of you may not even know what cricket looks like, right? But you all know what baseball is and how important it is to US culture, okay? So it's not a positive or a negative, right? We're just looking at differences and development. Okay, so let's look at the three types of constraints a little more closely. Alright, so our individual constraints, our who, who's doing the moving, right? So individual constraints are necessarily unique to that person, right? We can look at physical constraints and also mental characteristics. So they're internal and specific to that person. All right? The physical constraints we call structural constraints. And they're literally related to the body's structure. So how tall is this person? How much muscle mass does this person have? How flexible is this person? Right? And then our mental characteristics, our mental constraints, we call functional constraints. And they're related more to behavior, ideas, feelings. All right? So it could be attention. It could be motivation. It could be... Um, boredom, it could be fear, right? it could be excitement, okay? anything that's to do with um, sort of our behavior, our feelings, our thoughts. All right? So when we're the teacher, right, and I Ten, I use the term teacher to encompass coaches, therapists, trainers, right? All of us are teachers of one form or another. It's important to understand that when we're working with someone, what can we change to improve their movement pattern, right? So structural constraints are relatively slow to change. I can't make someone taller or shorter, right? I can make someone stronger, but not today. It takes time. I can help someone to become more flexible, 
but not today. It takes time, right? When we look at functional constraints of the individual, if I'm good at what I do, right, and I understand psychology and you know what makes people tick a little bit, and I know this person well, I've spent time getting to know them, then it may be possible to get a change today, right? They come in and they're not motivated for practice, right? But I know I can motivate them because I've set up this really cool practice experience for them, right? And I can change their engagement and therefore their movement pattern by motivating them, right? So when I'm a teacher, it's not always easy to change the person on the day. But maybe I can change the task or the environmental constraints to influence the movement skill that I want to see. Okay. So let's have a look at environment. Oops, where's my cursor gone? So environmental constraints, the where, right? These are properties of the environment. They are external to the person, right? Um, when we're looking at environment constraints, they're global, so they, they're not tied to the skill that's being performed, right? And they can be one of two types. They can be physical environmental constraints. So gravity, if we live on Earth, Gravity is an environmental constraint that all our motor skills are subject to, right? But if I'm walking on the moon, I don't have gravity. So if you've ever watched any film of people walking on the moon, you can see that their movement pattern is very different to our movement pattern of walking on Earth, where we have to deal with gravity, right? Physical constraints could also be something to do with the surface that the task is being performed on. Okay? So if it's a nice, warm, sunny day and I'm walking out to my car, right? but if it snows and it's icy and I'm walking out to my car, it's, it's a little different. Right? Because I'm, I'm getting old and I have osteopenia in my hips. I don't want to fall over. I'm going to be very careful to make sure that between here and my car, I don't slip and fall. Just by changing the surface that I'm walking on, what you see me do is going to be very different. The other type of environmental constraints that we can have are sociocultural. And these are a little bit more subtle, again, right? Things like gender roles, okay? Am I, am I told I have to behave a certain way, right? Or cultural norms, right? Or religion, okay? There's lots of socio-cultural characteristics that impact my movement skills. And then our third one, our task constraints, our what we're doing, right? we have three different options that we can classify under task constraints. And task constraints are not global, they are external to the individual, they're not right, related to the individual, but they're very specific to the motor skill I've been asked to perform. So I have three options here instead of just two, right? I can have the goal of the task. Now, this is one of those instances where you have to be a little bit careful about using the word goal, all right? Goal doesn't mean necessarily score, right? So not a goal, but 
What's the goal of the task? What is the task supposed to achieve? All right? The rules around the task. So am I playing a full team of soccer or am I playing three on three, right? If I'm playing tennis, do I allow the ball to bounce twice or do I stick to the typical rules that the ball can only bounce once? Right? And then the third one that can fit under task constraints is the equipment that's being used. I can manipulate the equipment as the teacher. Right? I can have big balls, I can have small balls, I can have light, soft, squishy balls, I can have heavy balls. Right? So, these are things that I can manipulate as the teacher. Right? So when I'm trying to analyze why a particular movement looks the way it does, I need to be able to identify the individual constraint, the environmental constraints, and the task constraints. And then I have to make an effort to understand the interaction between those three that is causing what I'm looking at. Right. So, as I mentioned earlier, this is quite a recent idea um, when we look at research across time um, from the 80s onward that we were looking at this emerging movement. All right. But it's a fascinating way to help explain the complexity of how skills change over the lifetime or under different circumstances. Right. Any questions? comes up, it's repeated in every chapter and everything that we do for the rest of the semester. Alright, so let it percolate a little bit and then if you've got questions, I actually won't be having office hours today because I've been given a job that has to be done. Um, but there is a discussion board, there is email, so if you have questions or we can answer questions for you next Tuesday. Alright? Okay, so let's have a look. I'm going to ask you some questions, so be ready to give me some answers. Don't leave me sitting here in silence, guys. I need to know you're out there. I can't see you. I can't see your faces. So make sure that you help me out here and talk to me. All right? Let's have a look at a piece of video and see how we apply some of these ideas. Let's get rid of that one. Pull up the... Okay, yeah, I want this one. All right, let's make it bigger. Okay, so, um, this is one of the film clips that is at your website. All right, and we're going to look at this kicking skill. And I have to keep pressing the arrow because they didn't put it on automatic repeat. So we don't have a soundtrack. I'm assuming that they told this young girl to run and kick the ball. Right? So um, being honest, right, because she's very cute, but this is not a very good attempt at running and kicking the ball, right? Um, 
So what's going on here? Okay. What do you see that might be impacting her attempt at this movement? What would you change if you, if that was her first trial, what would you change? Right? Think of it another way. What's the individual constraint, or what's one of the individual constraints that is impacting what this motor skill looks like. Um, would balance be one? Ooh, balance could be one. I don't think it's the most obvious one, but I think it's a fair um, it would be a fair choice, yeah? What's one that's more obvious, a structural one? Remember we're looking at the interaction of the task and the person. constraint would you change if you were the teacher? Uh, a smaller ball. Smaller ball. Yes. Excellent. Well done. Yeah. Precisely. You would give her a smaller ball, right? Because her structural constraint with that task, that ball, is the length of her legs, right? And the size of her feet. That ball is way too big for her to run and kick. Does that make sense? That's excellent, right? So, I can't make her legs longer today, but I can give her a smaller ball that might make it easier for her to run and kick the ball. Right? We don't know how much experience she has, so experience is a functional constraint. So it may be that she doesn't really understand how to run and kick the ball. Okay, so we've got a structural constraint, possible functional constraint, a task constraint because the ball is too big. And the other thing, given what I'm seeing there, is that you've got a ball on a very smooth floor and so the ball's not maybe standing still for her to kick it, right? So I would put a beanbag down and put the ball on a beanbag so that the ball is stationary for her to run and kick. So that gives us individual constraints, task constraint, environmental constraint just by looking at that little piece of film. Okay? Does that make sense for people? Right. How do I use the tool to explain what I'm looking at and make me a better teacher? All right, back to... Jumping in and out here a bit, but I think this is easier than putting the PowerPoint into the window. Any questions on that example? Thank you. I can't tell who it is talking because I've got the PowerPoint up, but thank you very much for engaging. I appreciate it. Okay.
initially. Um, research is performed on a typical population or an average population, all right? Um, but it can be very interesting to look at a population who are very much better at movement than average, or a population who are poorer at movement than average, for whatever reason, right? So when we look at atypical development, we can also use this triangle idea to help us out, right? So certain disabilities can impact movement skills. So they may be structural disability or it may be a functional disability, right? So they may develop a unique movement pattern, right? Um, if, say, they have cerebral palsy, then their walking pattern is very unique because of that disability, right? But sometimes what we see is not something that is very different, but something that is delayed, right? So certain disabilities, like if we have a child who's uh, ADHD, they tend to be delayed in their motor skills probably because of their lack of attention, but there's also some research that's indicating coordination issues within that population. But what we see with them is not that their movement pattern is necessarily very different to the norm, but that if they're 10, their movement pattern looks like maybe an eight-year-old instead of a 10-year-old, right? So certain disabilities will delay the development of movement skills, but if that individual is given enough time and enough practice, right, and enough patience, then it's possible for them to develop a quite mature version of the movement, right? But if it's something as dramatic as cerebral palsy, they can't ever, that, that unique pattern can't ever become normal. So, uh, I didn't put that link up, so let's do that now and see. this YouTube? Uh. Okay. All right. So this is um, 100 meter backstroke at the Paralympic and the Special Olympics. All right. Quite old piece of film now, but it's very fascinating to watch. So bigger okay so the gentleman in the middle there has no arms so to start the race he has to chew on the towel right gentleman near the top has someone else helping him holding him in for the start Long legs separating the swimmers there on the reaction of the starting blocks. Coming up in the lead though. 
Elaine Bafadi Zhang from China. Interesting technique here, changing between a dolphin butterfly leg motion where they're undulating through the whole body and then stepping into a regular kick, an alternating kick. With the left leg and right leg, there's a dolphin kick and a tight tuck around the wall. Dolphin kicking again underwater. But interesting technique there, something between a more modern motion here, the undulating dolphin motion, the fly kick, fastest way to move in the water is underwater, but of course they swim it on the surface. They're only allowed to go to 15 metres, and this race really hotting up now. Semenenko, Jay, Jiang, they're inside the final 15 metres. And this is where the medals are really going to be sought. Can the swimmers hold it together? Inside the final five, going to be Jiang for China. Jiang oh. takes the silver, so oh. then go the bronze. 113.56, a new Paralympic record, a new world record. Smashes that off, Plotinko of Russia, a record set in the year 2004. And he just realised he'll have to wait for the official time now. But 113.56 is <laughs> posted. Exciting. On the electronic scoreboard. Okay. So, I love that clip because it's just the most amazing example of how this interaction can change the movement pattern that you're able to watch. Okay, so you can see that major structural constraint gave us a very different backstroke pattern because you don't typically use a dolphin kick with backstroke um, with an able-bodied person, right? But there's not a lot of able-bodied people that could swim that 50 meters that fast. <laughs> so it's quite incredible to watch, I think. So, in certain circumstances then, um, a, a constraint that occurs early on in someone's life can influence the development of certain skills for them, the whole trajectory of that development. All right? um, we saw children a long time ago when Eastern Europe opened up we saw children who had been um, looked after in orphanages whose motor skills were very, very delayed. Also their social skills and their speech skills because when they, um, when they were kind of released per se, what they found was that to keep them safe, the people that worked in the orphanages had six and seven year olds sitting and staying in baby cots, right? That was their space because then they knew where they were and they knew they were safe. But, you know, you can't develop very good motor skills within a baby cot when you're age six, all right? So there are certain circumstances that can impact things long term, like that gentleman's structural constraints. In 1980, another model that was proposed that I like uh, for different reasons um, because it, I don't know if I have, let me see if I have a picture here if I have to draw it for you, hang on, no, I need to draw it for you. Oops, how do I go back? There we go, I have to draw this. Um, so, Seafelt, uh, so this was just before the constraints triangle came out. A uh, different model um, was proposed that includes this idea of a proficiency barrier. All right, so let me draw this for you. So it looks a bit like a, a pyramid, this model.
And it has maybe uh, two fundamental in that's our barrier. And then I can't remember if there's one division or two divisions. Okay, so what we have here is um, the idea of moving, of moving from a foundation and building on the foundation, all right? So this bottom line down here are um, infant type skills. So we're gonna see reflexes would fit in this box. Oops, that's not how you spell reflexes, sorry. Um, reflexes and kind of baby movements down here. And then the second box, the second layer really, are rudimentary skills. Good Lord, I can't type today guys, sorry. Rudimentary skills. So rudimentary skills would be things like sitting up on your own, um, standing up on your own, starting to walk, Right? Those would be rudimentary. And then the next layer is one we're going to spend a lot of time looking at, which is fundamental motor skills. Fundamental. Fundamental motor skills. Okay? And then we have what Seafelt called the proficiency barrier, right? Okay. And the idea that he was trying to visualize with this model is that in order to continue to progress your motor skills, you had to climb over the proficiency barrier. So after fundamental skills, we've got um, simple sports skills, right? And then we would have uh, maybe uh, lifetime activity skills. And then right at the top, we would have specialist movement skills, um, like you, a lot of you guys who compete, right? So the idea that he was showing was that if I want to achieve any of these skills higher up the pyramid, then I have to have a good grounding, a good foundation, a good layer of fundamental skills at an appropriate level of skill level, right? that allows me to climb this proficiency barrier and start to learn skills that are in the next layer. Does that make sense? So an easy example, right? I can't run if I can't walk. Walking is a rudimentary skill. Running is a fundamental motor skill, right? I can't be a sprinter if I can't run effectively, right? I can't play basketball or field hockey or soccer if I don't run very well, right? So I have to have fundamental skills that are at a competent level in order to start learning some of these more complicated skills. Questions?
Okay, I'm going to come back to these. I want to make sure I finish the information first and then we'll come back and look at these clips. Okay. All right. So, we're faced with a little bit of contradiction, all right, when we look at the development of motor skills. And they call it the contradiction, I use the word contradiction, but they call it a paradox. All right, we've got two things that kind of don't totally agree with each other. The first thing is that all humans are very similar in the development, if they're typically developing humans, right, if, they're, if they don't have any disabilities, if we're a typically developing human, we all look similar, right? At some point in our development, we will stand up on two feet, we will walk, we will run to some degree, right? And it doesn't matter whether I'm born in Tasmania or whether I'm born in Greenland, I stand up on two feet and I walk bipedally. Right? So that's called universality of development. All right? We have stages of skills that are predictable because of this universality, right? And tomorrow we will look at the MSU chart, which is showing us some stages that are predictable because of universality, all right? However, given universality, all of us are very different. Right? If I have the right equipment and I filmed everybody in the class walking and we slowed that down and we analyzed force production and force application and stride length and all these other factors that we could analyze, what we would see is that although we all walk on two feet, we all do it slightly differently. That's called variability. Okay? Each individual performs the skill in their own way. Right? So that means that we can arrive at the same end point, the same outcome of the skill, via quite different paths depending on who we are. So, again, then that means that as the teacher, I have to be careful about generalizing motor skills, right? Oh, everybody can catch a ball. Oh, no, they can't, <laughs> right? <laughs> Watch me on the playground. I'm terrible at catching balls, okay? Really good at cartwheels, but terrible at catching balls. Okay? We have to start to be able to be critical thinkers. We've got to think outside the box of the norm. Right? This is my picture of what this skill should look like. Why doesn't it look like that? What can I do about it? Right? How can I manipulate things to make the skill more efficient for this individual? Okay, questions, because we've got time to go back and look at those other two film clips, but I want to see if there are questions first.
bit of film. Now we're looking at throwing as a fundamental motor skill. Tomorrow, when we look at the MSU chart, I want you to visualize this piece of film because it's a perfect example of stage one of throwing. Okay, why do you say no? Because she's not bringing it back. Okay, all right. Good idea, all right. So, in our heads, right, what we consider throwing to look like doesn't look like that, right? But what we will talk about tomorrow is that every single one of us started throwing looking like that. All right, the research clearly shows us this. Now, you may only have looked like that for a couple of throws of the ball, depending on who you were working with, who was playing with you, whether you had someone else modeling a much different version of throwing, all right? But we all started here. So whilst we don't think of this as throwing, it's stage one of throwing, right? We don't move our feet. We don't swing our arm. We pick the ball up and we chuck it, okay? We know, obviously, that that changes, right? Because if I go to a playground and I watch older children throwing the ball to each other, they don't look like that, hopefully, right? If we're lucky, keep our fingers crossed, and if they don't get rid of PE and recess, right? Then older children should not be looking like this. Right? So we know this has to change. What we want to learn is how does it change? And why does it change? Right? So tomorrow we'll start looking at that idea. So the next clip same idea. Give him a ball, ask him to throw the ball. Great throw. It's not bad. It's not bad, right? If I was the PE teacher or the coach, I could work with this, right? There's a lot to change. He's stepping to the side instead of stepping forwards, right? He's not using any hip rotation. He's got a little bit of shoulder rotation. Doesn't the film jumps? It doesn't look like he has much of a backswing. It looks like he takes the ball straight to his shoulder, but it's not a very clear piece of film to, to decide that from. Right? 
So this is very different to the young lady we just watched. But it also isn't a baseball pitcher or a quarterback. Okay. So there's still things that can change with that movement pattern given the right interaction, right? So given the right environment which involves a good teacher, parents that are going to help out, or a sibling who throws well, right? Given an individual who's motivated to learn to throw better than that, right? Given a teacher that can manipulate the task and keep it interesting and work different aspects of the movement pattern, then we could transition that to something that was more competent that would go over the proficiency barrier and then we could really start working on throwing. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I very much appreciate you talking to me, thank you. Um, so you'll find out I'm a bit of a geek about motor skills and the development of motor skills. This is my area of of um, research, it's what I did my PhD in, um, so I, I get a bit passionate about it um, because in our current climate, what what we need to do with these children is getting threatened. Right? We are cutting PE. We are cutting resources for PE. Some places are cutting. Um, playtime and outdoor time so that the children can spend more time in the classroom learning math or whatever, right? So what we do as a profession, what, what you guys are going to do when you leave school is under threat right now and, and so it's important that, that we fight back because We've got a lot of work to do to get PE every day for every child, to get you know two or possibly three outdoor play times a day for every child, right? This is what we need. And um, we, we're gonna have to work hard over the next 15 years to, to get that back, all right? So tomorrow, please make sure you have a copy of your MSU chart, otherwise you're gonna be very lost, okay? And um, yeah, I think that's all I have for you today, unless someone's got questions. Uh, you can always bring questions tomorrow. Where, where is one that you for? The MSU chart is, let me show you, You've got to go to the. Oh, I have to put this to a new tab. Hang on. All right. Okay. So. When you go to your welcome page in Blackboard, you'll see that you've got a link for Motor Behaviour and a link for Motor Behaviour Lab. Go to the lab, click on the lab notes on the left hand side, go into the course, sorry, go into the course packet, and the first thing in the course packet is the MSU chart. Okay? And so, um, do we need to have it like uh, printed or? Um, you don't have to have it printed. Um, I would download it so that you can at least look at it on the screen as I'm talking to you about it. Um, eventually, I would say, you know, what you want to do over the course of 
your time in the program is create yourself um, a, a toolbox, right? So that you, when you graduate, all these things that you've learned about that will help you teach and assess and, and do all these other things you have to do, um, you've got in one place. So I would encourage you to print it out and put it in a binder somewhere. Um, but that is, you know, I'm an old-fashioned chalk and blackboard paper and binder girl. Doing things electronically gives me the heebie-jeebies. So I could just be too far out of date to be worth <laughs> to be worth saying it. You know, I mean, if you're comfortable having an electronic copy, you know, and then when you're teaching or you're going out and you're assessing and you've got your electronic copy on some form of tablet or on your phone, and that's, you know, you guys, your generation is much more comfortable with that idea than, than mine, right? So, as long yeah, as you can see, you. yeah. It is a PDF, so unless you've got particular software, um, you're not going to be able to make notes on it or anything, which is the other reason I like a real copy, because then I can scribble on it. But um, if you've got Adobe, whatever it is that lets you edit a PDF, you'll be okay. All right? Okay, gang, we are done for today. I will see you tomorrow at 12. Have a super afternoon. It's going to be, if you're here in Portales, it's going to be really warm. So enjoy. Get outside a little bit and take some time to enjoy the sun. All right? Thank you, ma'am. Have a good day. Thank you. And you.